I want to welcome all of our other churches and small groups who are joining us today. And we are so excited that you are a part of the Naked and Unafraid series. I hope that you're having a good time with it. I hope that God is speaking to you through the series that we're in right now and the small groups that you're in. We began our series in the story of King David dancing in the streets while his wife, McCall, watched him from a window. And later that night, she gave him a piece of her mind. Anybody remember us talking about this? She referred to him as foolish and naked. And then he let her know that she may want to be more like her dad in that her dad was dignified and always uh, protective and guarded, but that God had chosen him above her father to be the king. And that's where we began this series, is that one scene having to do with, uh, uh, you know, a, a marriage spat that was going on in Jerusalem between the king and his wife, and I want to remind you that there's two ways to live your life. You can be a window watcher whose lifestyle is shaped by window logic, you know, the fear of stepping out, messing up, not being good enough, rejection, all that kind of stuff, or you can be a street dancer who lives vulnerable and open despite the urge to play it safe. That's what I call the naked and unafraid life. It's a life where you repeatedly do these five things. These five things. And this has been our series. The first one is that you risk exposure. The second one is that you abandon smallness. The third one is that you push past criticism. The fourth one is that you own your story. And then today, we're going to wrap it up talking about fight for your future. Do I have anybody in the house who today you've made up your mind, I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight for the future God has for me. Okay, say this with me. Say, my heart's open. My mind's ready. Make me better, God. By your word. I receive it, and I believe it, and I won't be the same again. In Jesus' name. Give you a little background on 1 Samuel 17, and then I'll read a verse out of that. David, who was still a teenager, was on the battlefield delivering supplies to his older brothers who were in the battle, when he heard, or overheard, I should say, a conversation that the king was offering a reward to any soldier who would go into battle against the nine-foot-tall giant, Goliath the Gittite. Just for perspective on Goliath, Goliath wore bronze armor that weighed 125 pounds, more than my wife. (laughs) Armor weighed more than Sheila. (laughs) A bronze helmet on his head, and he carried a bronze javelin slung over his shoulder. Another soldier assisted him and walked in front of him carrying his shield. That was the picture that David saw when he looked out across the valley at the giant who was threatening and opposing him and his people. The king's reward for anyone who would fight the giant was a lifetime of tax-free status, hello, (laughs) and the king's daughter in marriage 
which if you're a young single guy looking for a candidate, <laughs> if, if you want fame and fortune, right, you got it right there. Like no tax, tax-free status in the family. And history says she was beautiful. So it got David's attention, and in the noisy chaos, just to prove it, that's what got his attention. Let me read to you. He wanted, he wanted to make sure he heard it right, the offer, the reward. Verse 26, David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? It's like, I think I heard it right. I want to make sure I heard it right. He was in that risk versus reward process. And that's what going on inside of his head. So I think it's fair for me to go a little bit deeper into what was happening in David. On one hand, he, he's got a conversation like this. What happens if I don't fight? Like, if I don't fight, God has no opportunity to give us the victory. If I don't fight, my nation is going to be humiliated. We'll be slaves to our enemy. If I don't fight, there's no hope for the future. On the other hand, if I fight, I could win. And that means freedom and prosperity for my family, for God's people, and some huge rewards in my family tree, in my legacy, in our future. Go, David. Let me just say this to you today. God's plan for your future doesn't just happen. You have to fight for it. Oh, come on. I think you need to make some noise for that because you need to know that in your heart. It doesn't just happen. You have to fight for it. Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a what? A hope and a what? Come on. God says plans to give you a hope and a God has a plan. And God's plan for your future is a plan to bless you, to prosper you. He wants the best for you, for your children. Maybe this is the most important thing you need to get way down deep in your heart. Because there's a lot of people who aren't really sure what God's intention is, what God is all about, what God wants. And when storms come and problems come and giants stand on the opposite hillside of their life, this is where they get undermined. This is where they waver is because they don't really understand God has a good plan. He wants to give you a hope, and he wants to give you a future. But that doesn't mean you won't have to fight for it. 1 Timothy 6 says, fight. Fight the good fight of faith. Ephesians 6 says, put on all God's armor so that you can be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. Just just so you know, the Bible does teach us about a good God, a loving God, a caring God, but the Bible is also filled with the awareness that God is good, but you got to fight. You have an enemy and you have to fight. I've loved this next verse for many years. Years ago as a teenager, I discovered Psalm 144 and 1. And he praises the Lord. He says, praise be to the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers to fight. So good. I 
think I just quoted my King James Version. It just, fingers for battle might be the one you're looking at. But fingers, to, he trains. God, so good. But, but the thing that he has done that is best is he has taught me to be a fighter. He has taught me to not quit, give up, sit down when stuff goes wrong and life is hard. Come on, sir. See, you may have to fight a battle more than once to win it, Margaret Thatcher said. <laughs> what wisdom is there in that? Sometimes we're like, you mean I got to go back and fight that again? I thought already. Yeah, you got to go back and keep fighting for some battles. Now, the giants that you and I face are not physical giants, right? But let's talk about what it is. It's a resistance in various forms that hinders us from moving forward and being all that we're meant to be. Yes. That's the battle for us. In fact, can I, I tell you that we use the illustrations as helpful, the physical battle part, um, you know, we, we envision, we use the word fight, we envision fighters in a ring, we envision fighters in a cage, we envision MMA, we envision the boxing match, we, we envision fight, 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 we envision a battle, soldiers, military, foxholes, and that's all good because there, there, there's some elements of truth in all of that that can pass over to the battle we're talking about, but just so we acknowledge it, and understand the reality is that the, the, the physical fighting is the lowest form of fighting. The highest form of fighting is the fighting we do on a daily basis with things like distractions. When, when I was writing this book, I was fighting distraction. I was fighting brain blocks. I was fighting motivation dips. I don't want to do this no more. I'm done. Yeah. Over, check out, take this book and shove it. <laughs> Can I just tell you, everyone faces resistance and opposition on your path to purpose. Everyone. People you admire, whether they're great athletes, they're in the Olympics, uh, they achieve great things in life, just understand that your admiration for them, there's something in your head, you just see them, well, oh my goodness, they arrived, right, uh, you don't know the battle. You have no idea what they had to go through to get where they are. Never underestimate, you're no different than anybody else. Everybody, everybody has resistance on the path of purpose. We deal with the inner critic. We deal with negative history. We deal with our own fear of inadequacy. Fight, fight, fight. And just because God's called you to do something doesn't mean you won't have to fight for it. Oh man, that's so good. I, I'm encouraging myself in the Lord right now. Secondly, don't make it your goal to avoid stress. Make it your goal to be your best in the stress. Just a fighting, fighting tip today. If you're trying to avoid pressure, stress, you're missing the point. There is no such thing, hear me out on this, there is no such thing as a meaningful stress-free life. Amen. In fact, pressure and stress is where the good things happen. Amen. Now, we all know the warnings about stress, how it can be harmful to our health and so forth, but I'm, I'm just going to jump on the other side because no one had this conversation with me when I was a 28-year-old, 29-year-old, 30-year-old pastor. I was going to pastor's retreats and events and trying to listen and lean in from pastors who were experienced. And a lot of times, I just heard them talk about, you got to get away, you got to get out of the stress. And, and I heard that, but I just wanted to understand, well, when I go home, I'm going to face a bunch of it. Like, can you help me out a little bit more than just telling me to take a vacation every once in a while? 
And that's where this thing was born in me, because we all know the warnings about physical challenges and not, not letting stress overwhelm us and how it can hurt you, but rarely do we ever hear that stress has an upside. Like, not all stress is bad stress. And to live with no stress is an unreasonable goal if you want to live a meaningful life. Wow. Are y'all hearing me today? Like, are you glad if you're married, happily married? You glad you fell in love? You glad you got married? Amen, amen. It's awesome, isn't it? It's great. But can I just tell you, marriage has stress. When do two different people commit to do life together, get ready, get ready. Get ready. <laughs> Family life as stress. Can't wait to have babies, you, that young couple. Well, get ready. Children are a blessing. But parenting is stress on steroids. Can I get any amen anywhere? Like Education. We need it. I encourage young people, keep going, don't stop. Don't quit in high school. Glad you got that diploma. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. But education has stress. You can't grow without some grind in your life. Man, this is meant for some of you today. Because you hadn't quite connected the dots. You're a good man. You're a great person. You're, you're a person who loves God, but you've never been able to really reconcile this whole idea of, of like, well, how do I keep the stress off? How do I stay away from the stress and, and still have a meaningful life? You don't. You don't. In fact, let me take it a bit further. God is in the stress. It always amazes me when I come across people in Christian world who avoid pressure because they want to be where God is. And they, assume, and they assume God's not in the stress. So they think of God, when they think of God, they think of God stays in the quiet, calm, that quiet, calm place with serene surroundings. And while there's a truth to a time in your life, call a time out, head for the Mount of Olives. I get it. Somebody needs to understand that some of God's best works are done in pressure-filled places. Places He's assigned us to. Jungles He has literally put us in. Pressure is where giants fall. Pressure is where battles are won. Pressure is where babies are born and diamonds are formed. We don't need to run from pressure. We, we want to embrace pressure and understand God is in the stress. God is not just in the quiet. God is in the stress. Is somebody this weekend finding yourself right now in a in a place that is wild and crazy, a pressure situation, at work, at school, in your family, at your church. I hope you're hearing me. Don't let pressure drive you away from the places that God has planned for you to experience your greatest victories, your greatest rewards. Can I say it again? The place of pressure is where battles are won. It's where giants fall. There is no such thing as hakuna matata on the pathway of purpose. Some of you are like, I'm so disappointed you're breaking my heart. <laughs> I know, I'm just trying to be a messenger of truth today. Yes. 
We are, not, we are not here on the planet to sit back in our, our rocking chair, our lazy boy. Our, we're here on a mission. We're here on divine assignments. The good news is that God is with you. God is in the stress. God is in the stress. The Apostle Paul said we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Write it down, Romans 8, 37. We are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors. The writer Isaiah says it like this, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. God says, I will be with you, not just in the good places, but when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Anybody thankful for that? Can anybody testify to the truth in that? God is with us always in everything. We don't rush into that fire scenario, that, that, that battle, that war facing giants, and God just kind of sits back and says, good luck with that. No, God's like, yeah, come on, boy. Come on, girl. I, I, you were born for this. <laughs> I've got great victories ahead on the other side of the battle. Keep on fighting. Your greatest enemy is not the giants in your life. It's how you see yourself compared to those giants. Mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm. Scripture says that David ran towards the giant. <laughs> Think about that. He's saying... What's that? What, 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 what'd you say? What, what, what's the reward? Tax-free status? <laughs> King's daughter in marriage? You got my attention now? Because I know all the other stuff. My nation, my nation will have freedom. That ugly guy over there on that other hill, he might be big, but I'm bigger on the inside. And, you know, he just, he, he did a little bit of trash talking. I kind of like that myself. Like, because the giant was trash talking him. And he's like, you come to me with a sword and a spear. I come to you in the name of the Lord. You're, you're going down. You're going down. You're going down. I'm going to cut your head off. I'm going to feed your body, your carcass to the fowls of the air. I ain't playing with you. Whoa, come on, David. Anybody seeing it today? I want to just go back real quick because it keeps coming to my mind that I know some of you, especially men in the audience today, you get into a good fight. You get into the boxer. You get into the MMA. You get into the war zone. You get in. But then you're, you're really wimpy when it comes to the battle I'm talking about. So can you, like, can, can you just use this analogy and take it home with you this weekend and say physical fighting is the lowest form of fighting? I need to be a warrior within. I need to win over those things that are pulling me off course with the plan God has for my life. Because literally, when he went to fight the giant, he first of all had won the battles within him. Like he had been out there in the shepherd field winning battles about who he was, who God called him to be. Yes. And, and that's maybe why I'm so, I love the Naked and Unafraid book so much. I know I wrote it, can I still love it? Like, I just love it because it picks up early in his life. I mean, it bounces around in one man's life named David and I admire him so much for the things that I'm talking about today. He put himself out there. He refused to play it safe. He loved God. He sang loud, worshiped 
worshiped strong, raised hands, danced in the street. He was not a wimpy man of God. He was a strong man of God. He stood up against the enemy when the en enemy came to hurt him and hurt his family. He was a warrior. He was a man's kind of man who also knew how to win the battle within. Mm -mm -mm. Others are anxious to run away from the fight. They're sitting in their tents, knees knocking together. Trained military, trained soldiers freaking out. And they want to run the other way. David, on the first day on the battlefield, gets his attention. And he starts saying, wait, 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 what's going on here? And then he's starting to think, I was made for this. <laughs> and he declared the giant dead before the stone was in the air. And this is how he lived his life. He repeatedly put himself in a place of being vulnerable. He repeatedly made moves with no guarantee of the outcome. When God, through his servant Moses, told his people to leave Egypt and go to the promised land, God knew about the giants that were in the land that he planned to give to them. God knew. Think, think about this with me. God knew about the giants in the land that he planned to give to them. There was a group of spies that went out to spy out the land that God had promised to give them, and they brought back a huge cluster of grapes to verify how fertile the land was, how good the land was. Everything God said about the land is really, really, really true. But then they also said, but there's giants in the land. There's giants in the land. It was as if they, in their mind, thought that God would be surprised. Can, are you tracking with me? I think sometimes we get in a place where God put us, and we're like, oh, but there are giants here, as if God didn't know. Before we actually were there on assignment, like, uh, yep. Yeah, I don't think God, I don't, I, God knew about the soil. God knew about all the nice stuff in the land, but he must not have known about the giants. And they gathered around that idea, and the, the worst thing they did was, it, it's, it's in Numbers chapter 13. It, it says that we seem like grasshoppers. They, they were given a report, and they said, we seem like grasshoppers compared to the giants. We seem like that in our own eyes, and then we look the same to them. Like, really? Are, are you serious? Like, you're on the border of something better. You've traveled through the desert all this way on a promise from God, and now you're talking about the smallest, ugliest creature in the desert, and you're comparing yourself to that. That's how you see yourself? Like, really? See, the people in this story saw themselves as grasshoppers, but that's not how God saw them. And their self-concept caused them to count themselves out of what God had included them in. Hear, hear me out on that. Chances are, it's the same way with you right now. Yes. You look at your weakness, and God looks at your strength. Amen. If you're not careful, you're, you're going to focus on what you can't do. And God the whole time is focused on what you can do. Amen. Watch out, sir. Watch out. You're looking at your past. <laughs> but you got to understand while you're looking and talking and referring to your past, God has already put that behind you, and God's looking at your future.
You're looking at who's against you, what's against you, how hard it's going to be. And God's saying, hey, if I'm with you, then who can be against you? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter the trial of your faith in your life right now. I am for you. My power is with you. And you can do all things. You can do all things through my power that works within you. Do yourself a favor today. Recognize right now that the future of your life will be determined in large part by your own self-concept. By what you include yourself in or count yourself out of. God can be the greatest God. The most amazing God who wants to give you hope in the future. But everyone who saw themselves as grasshoppers, they died in the wilderness. I said they died in the wilderness. I said they died in the wilderness. And that is not, and that's where we get messed up, and that, that's where I hope some of you will never forget what I'm talking about today. Just because God promises you something doesn't mean you don't have to fight for it. Wow, come on. I think, I think somebody's breaking out today. I think some man is going to break free today. There were, there were two households that made it, the household of Joshua, the household of Caleb. You know why? Because they never bought into the grasshopper mentality. They saw themselves as overcomers. They said, we can certainly do this. Let's go for it. God said it. I believe it. I'm going to live my life in fight mode. And we're, we're going to lay hold of everything God says we can have and we will not give up. We may, we may have some temporary setbacks, but we are people of the comeback. And we are determined that we will push forward, press forward, and never stop. Never stop. And never give up to fulfill the things that God has put in front of us. We will live naked and unafraid. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big hand today, can't we? Let's just celebrate God's word. Wow. I want to pray with you right now. You received the word today. You received the word even that we've been giving the last few weeks. You feel like God's doing some things in your life. I want to take just a quick moment here and want to recognize the work of the Holy Spirit. How God's talking to us. God's talking through us. Father, I thank you. Your word never returns void. It always accomplishes what it's sent forth to do. And this is no exception. And God, we offer thanks today for the way the spirit of revelation enlightens us, makes us aware how you lead and guide us into all truth. Thank you today, God, for the way you've been talking to men and women, even in the house today and through your word, Lord. We have victory. Through your word, we have hope. Through your word, we overcome our enemy. And my prayer today, Lord, is that there will be people who will say, I'll never be the same again. People who will shout back at the giant and say, yeah, you may be big, but I'm bigger on the inside. My prayer today, God, is that as we leave the house and we go our own direction, the residue of your word will linger in us, on us, in our soul. 
that through our own devotions this week, through our own time of prayer this week, that Holy Spirit, you will reinforce this moment in our lives, that we are champions, we are born of God, and everything born of God overcomes the world. In Jesus' name. With heads still bowed and eyes closed, I love this opportunity I get every week. Because there's a man, a woman, there's a young person, there's a couple. It's not an accident that you're here. This is your moment, your time for a fresh new start in your relationship with God. And I want to pray with you that prayer that I call the prayer of new beginnings. If that's you today, I'm going to ask you right now to join all of us as we pray. Just say this out loud. Say, Lord Jesus, Jesus. welcome to my world. Come into my heart, my life, forgive me of all my sin, and make me a new person. I receive you now as the leader, as the Lord of my life, and I'll never be the same again. In Jesus' name. Now, at every location, I'm going to ask you, if you just prayed that prayer for the first time or recommitted your life to God, I'm going to ask you to put your hand up really bold right now, really high right now, all over the auditorium. Come on and declare, I have a new beginning today. Come on. I am a born again believer today. Come on. Just raise that hand up. Raise that hand up. We welcome you to the family of God. God bless you guys.